Praise God family, Pastor Mel here. Listen, whether you got connected with our marriage enrichment, young adult ministry of serving in the children's shelter, even the nursing home, whether you met us in person or online, we are a small church making a big impact. We got a message for you. Come grow with us. All right, family, we're getting it together. We're getting it together. Well, almost anyway, I think I almost got everything I need. Let me just move this out the way and we should be good. And I'm going to bring our team in position. We want to say good evening to everybody watching the broadcast. We have Lady K downstairs and she's doing what she does to bring in those who are calling in to the study. want to put that up first. You can dial in at 701-801-1211. And the access code is 248-722-999. That's not for the benefit of you watching right now. That's for the benefit of you. You may have a loved one somewhere. They're not able to get access to Facebook, but they can call in and hear this powerful study that's about to happen on tonight. And I'm telling you, it's going to be powerful because the Holy Ghost is going to move through here. Let me get my main man. Batman is in the house, y'all. He's, <laughs> he's not in Gotham City tonight. He's here with us on the set. And I'm so grateful, grateful, grateful. And then I believe okay. Minister Carol just flew in from where I don't know, but she's here. And we are the better because of it. And then we got my girl. Look at here. We're going to talk about this in a minute, y'all. I know what you're going to say. I know. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and then we got then we got my big sis. And I'm so grateful all the way holding it down in New York land. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Do I have everybody in place? Mm -hmm. I yes. think I might have a little echo. How does it sound on your side on for you guys? No echo. No echo? Okay, it might just be my phone. Right we want to say good evening to some people chiming in. Let me also say there's a birthday man out there somewhere. I hope he took his medicine and got all showered up. That's my dad. He is 83 years old today. So y'all happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. Hey. Carl Outlet, 83 years young on today we're grateful to god we got let me see let me see what we got here we got mark anthony is in the house all right we got hey mark you you, you see that uh-huh i know what you're talking about <laughs> i'll pick you up if you i'll pick you up if you get here we got anthony is in the house we got my girl catherine moore is in the house he says joyful evening to everybody we got Minister Sandy is in the house, and we are getting this thing back. Y'all help us to share the word. It's going to be a powerful, powerful lesson tonight. I promise you it's going to be so worth your time. And without any further ado, I'm going to ask one of these uh, uh, sons or daughters of God to open us up in prayer, and we shall begin. Whoever should be led. I'll pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, how we thank you, Lord God, for another opportunity you, Lord God, to come thank on you, the airway, Lord God, to come into your presence, Lord God, and the invitation to come into each person's home, Lord God. Lord God, we ask now that it will be your voice that they hear, that it will be you that they see, Lord God, and that this lesson, Lord God, will break chains, that it will invoke thought, Lord God, and it will call people to run toward you, Lord God. And we do it all for no other reason than your glory and your honor yes, and your God. praise, Lord God, for it all belongs to you. And thank you in advance for what you've already done that we are yet to see. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 That's where that feedback is coming from. <laughs> on here. So let's get this party started. We got a lot of ground to cover and a short time to get there. We are in the chapter that is entitled uh, A Five Pound Dream. And I've read this thing a few times and I'm telling you it is some kind of good to me. A Five Pound Dream is based upon 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 21. Um, 
So let me go ahead and read that real quick for you. That's 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse number 21. And I want to give you the subtitle because this uh, uh, has a subtitle for his uh, chapter title as well. Five pound dream, he snatched the spear. So verse the 21st verse says this, and he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Let the church say amen. 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 Let the church say amen again. Amen. amen. Any, anytime you're dealing with a weapon <clears throat> that comes up against someone with a lethal weapon, and is able to position himself in such a way that he gets the weapon, which is lethal, from the enemy's hand, snatches it, and then kills the enemy with his own weapon. That's a bad somebody, right? And, right. That, and that's and that's been an eye. That I mean, he wrote the script on that thing. If you if you looked up an encyclopedia, uh, encyclopedia, a bad shut your mouth. You'll see Ben Anaya right there. And I want to say this, here we are on day number 260 with 106 days remaining in the year 2020. And Benaniah does not want to be by himself. Benaniah wants some company. He wants to give us the inspiration as we read his storyline. And as Pastor Mark Batterson put this story together, all of us should be inspired to become much more like Benaniah so that we can go face the enemy take the weapon out of the enemy's hand and do him harm the way that he intended to do it. So he starts the story talking of, talking about uh, a gentleman by the name of Santiago Matata. I was very inspired by, by Santiago and how God worked in his life. And I know my big sis will identify with some of this, uh, but it starts out, the storyline starts out talking about Santiago, Santiago growing up as a young boy. Here he is, he's in Colombia, and he's what we call army crawling across the floor of his home, somewhere maybe in the living room or den. And the reason he's army crawling across the floor is not a game, it's a survival skill. He learned to do that because as often was the case, bullets were flying everywhere. And uh, depending upon where you grew up with, you know, you always had some kind of activity in the hood, but it wasn't nothing like this. See, the storyline shows that in his youthful days, it was just an everyday type of occurrence. He would go out in the neighborhood and it was nothing for him to see tanks, helicopters, all kinds of jeeps, and even hear the sound of bombs exploding in the background. Now, I've heard some things growing up in Brooklyn, but I, di I didn't see all of that. So I can tell you that he was really dealing with some very uh, life-changing, life-altering type of occurrences for a young man to have to experience. His dad, in fact, the storyline shows, was a chef. And this <laughs> chef his dad worked for the guerrillas, not G-O, but G-U-E, the guerrillas who supplied cocaine for the biggest cocaine king inside the whole country of Colombia. In fact, he was known everywhere. You probably saw some of his Netflix uh, expeditions by the name Pablo Escobar. Pablo had a net worth, illegally as it was, of over $100 billion. In fact, he supplied 80% of the cocaine being smuggled into the United States. So that was the backdrop of the storyline about this young man, Santiago. Well, it just so happens that uh, he got out of the hood. His mom brought him to the United States, got away from the crime and the violence, came to the United States. Uh, he loved uh, he loved his mom, but he also loved his country. And he wanted to go back. He longed to return. And it went on to show that in December of 2012, he decided to go back. And he's there at what they, uh, uh, the, the, foot, the foothills of the Andes, the Andes mountain range. And he's having breakfast, and he's having breakfast with a pastor. And there are two other gentlemen there. They are uh, farmers. And these men who are farmers, they were very courageous. They had already pretty much gone through hell, 
and they were putting their lives in jeopardy. Their lives were being risked because all of their livelihood was based upon what Escobar and all the drug lords had all of them doing. That is growing the co the cocoa plant and as a result, producing uh, what was necessary to create the cocaine. Well, they said enough is enough. We're not doing it anymore. In fact, they got away from doing that. They no longer wanted that to be a part of their life. And their dream now was to use their land, their labor and their love to farm coffee, <laughs> not Starbucks. But coffee, that's what they wanted to do. And they didn't know how to do it. Then all of a sudden, Santiago showed up and their dream was soon to become a reality. Here's a quote, and then I'm going to ask some questions. That's the backdrop of everything the lesson <laughs> brings it out. His quote says this, Santi, as he calls him, returned to America with five pounds of coffee beans in a dream called Redeeming Grounds. I want to ask each one of you, what kind of tensions, what kind of frustrations or challenges were these men facing while they were there having breakfast at the base of that big mountain? What, what type of tensions, what type of frustrations and challenges can you see as you read this story? Do you think they were, they were fighting against as they're, they're having a good breakfast and Santiago, he's, he's grateful to be back home, but when they drop this this bomb on them about what they really want to do. Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of tensions and challenges do you think they were facing? Well, it's life threatening because uh, certainly uh, the drug dealers don't want to lose any money, and they've already staked out this property for what they want to do. So these mm -hmm. people were putting their lives in their hands uh, to switch this up. They would they would uh, get ready to disrupt the uh, drug dealers' whole status quo, you know? Right. <laughs> they had the way they wanted to have it. And now here you come with this, you want to do coffee. You don't you don't want to help us make money anymore. That's dangerous stuff. Woo. It is it's past dangerous. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the type of stuff that people don't live to tell their side of the story. Right. Nikki, what do you think about that? I pulled two things from everything that you read. The first one would be is how the the little boys, when when Santiago was a boy, how he grew up in the atmosphere and environment of war. And then when he later on was meeting with those men, they had a dream in the midst of an atmosphere of war, drug, and violence. And so I just thought those uh, two things were very interesting, um, that in spite of the environment, and in spite of everything that was going around, there was still this dream to do something different, mm -hmm. you know, to do something other than what they were, uh, what they right. were around and were facing. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, but you can still dream no matter what environment, or no matter what atmosphere you're in, you can still dream. Right, right. And, and in this case, his dream could have been a deadly dream but he didn't allow it to stop him. Yeah. What do you think burned in his heart? Here he is. He's growing up, you know, what we call different parts of the country, whether it's Chicago, whether it's Miami, uh, L.A., Compton, New York, whatever. We call it living in the hood. Right. But I, I don't think we really see no hood because I, I, I ain't seen nowhere where the helicopter, well, I have seen some helicopters, but helicopters, jeeps, tanks. I mean, they, they're riveting the house. I mean, right. and, and they're playing for keeps. You would think that if you were traumatized like that as a young boy and you get up out of there, the last thing you want to do is go back. Is go back home. Right. What do you think was in his spirit that got him safely to the United States, but he wants to go back home? What, what, what do you think that was? I think there's a level of tenacity and a level of like when you grow up in a certain atmosphere, you get away and you see better. You want to go back sometimes and help whoever is left or help that environment, the city, the hood that you grew up in. But I think it was a certain level of tenacity and desire, that thing that's putting you with that dream. You know, sometimes we get these dreams put in us when we're young and they don't die. And mm -hmm. even though our hoods are not like those, but you have people growing up um and war and i'm sorry and uh drug infested well it is war because it's gang war territory but they come out as as uh as star athletes 
mm-hmm. come out as doctors. Mm-hmm. You know, what they're in probably fuels those dreams because they don't want to continue to live their life like that. They want something better than what they have lived in. That's good. Minister Carroll, why do you think he went back? To maybe to... You blanked out on it. You blanked out on it. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Sometimes, I think sometimes we want to go back because uh, we want to prove to others that there is a way out. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes when people are living that way, they think that that's the only way. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes God is predestined and ordained for us to be that I- I- example. And I'm, I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about how I didn't experience that as a child. I didn't experience the, um, mm-hmm. the, the, the drugs and all of that. My husband did and I, I hear stories from him. I was only, I was poor, but I was not exposed to all the street violence and all of that, the drugs and all of that. As a matter of fact, I didn't really know anything about drugs until I was older and went away to college. Mm-hmm. So I, when I think about that, I would think, what would make a person go back? And I think about my husband and all the challenges that he faced. Mm-hmm. But he is an example that reform can and transformation can take place. And I think that that would probably be a reason to go mm-hmm. back, to mm-hmm. go back to, you don't just want to be delivered yourself. I believe you're truly delivered when you can go back and get someone else. And right. That's right. good. good. Which is what the Bible tells us to do. All right. Minister Wayne, what do you think the motivation? Can you put your finger on anything differently? Well, I just uh, based on what the author originally said that he left, when he left, he left his heart there. Mm-hmm. And I was, the first thing that popped in my mind was his father. Because it said he left and went to America with his mom. So mm-hmm. I was thinking, well, maybe he's trying to go back for the rest of his family. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, was that the, the motivation to get him to actually turn around and go back in there? Uh, and I think a lot of times we have those situations as well where, you know, we've made it out of the ghettos. We've made it out of the situations that our families have been in the hard time. Mm-hmm. You want to go back to your family because you, you watch right. each other grow up and mm-hmm. you'll see, you know, your cousins and, and other family members struggling. And you're like, look, there's another way to do this. Mm-hmm. And so you try to help influence a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, maybe their thinking to help them get away from where they're at. Right. Right. He made a good point because a lot of us do that. A lot mm-hmm. of us, when we make it or we get some money, you want to bring everybody from the hood, everybody <laughs> along with you. <laughs> yeah, we try. We try anyway. Uh, here he is. He's a, he's an adult now. Back. At the base, as they say, as they say, of the Andes Mountain, he's probably having some coffee with his breakfast. There's a pastor there, and there's these two farmers. They're sharing their dream. On what scale would you call this? We talked about this earlier. Is this coincidence? Is it providence? If coincidence is one, providence is ten. Where would you put this experience? that at this particular time, because he could have went back earlier, or he could have not went back at all. What is this that's happening? Is it coincidental? Is it providential? And what does that have to do with the price of coffee, wherever we are? (laughs) Um, I'm going to say that's providence. That's a 10. uh, Because he didn't just happen to go back at the time he went back and run into this pastor, two gentlemen uh, who are specifically looking for a way to get out of the business they're currently in and get into Mm -hmm. a better business. Mm -hmm. Um, And his dream and their dream all became one dream. And that's just, yeah. I mean, that's, that's Providence right there. Mm. Big sis, does that resonate with you in terms of how the timing that if he would have went weeks, months or even days at a different time perhaps those two men would not even have been there to have breakfast with them that this was something that was so providential at that particular time in his life that god was meeting a need bridging folk together does that speak to you and if it does why it does and and first of all it said that the men had been praying for three years that god would show them how Mm. to be able to um do that coffee uh, the grow the coffee in, in in place of the cocaine. So I think that was a, a divine, definitely a divine encounter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that Kairos moment that we talk about. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's that time, the right time, the right place, the right people are there, 
and God knows how to put things together and answer prayer. Um, yeah. I totally believe that you can be praying for a thing and three years, if they prayed for three years and they didn't give up mm -hmm. they were committed to the prayer, they were committed to the dream. And uh, I think with um, Santiago, I'm pretty sure since we're opening up with him uh, crawling across the floor, mm -hmm. the army crawl as a little boy, mm -hmm. uh, even though his, his dad was the chef to these people who were causing all this nonsense or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, he was pretty much traumatized. Uh, that's something that will stay with you all your life. Right. And, uh, probably hated the circumstances he had to grow up in because, I mean, how fearful is that for you to be able to, be able to cross these people? Uh, mm. his, his dad volunteered to be the chef. I yeah. mean, he might have been a chef and might have wanted to work somewhere else, but yeah. the decisions were made for him. Yeah, and retirement didn't look that good. Yeah, I'm pretty sure what he had in his heart, uh, the trauma, the resentment of, of what these people were able to do, uh, he had to have the heart ready to want to see mm. change as well. Mm. So he put this together and all of a sudden now, looks coincidental that you would just be having breakfast, but I don't believe there's any coincidences in God. I think that he plans and uh, he had that all laid out. Mm -hmm. And when those three years, like the Bible says, in the fullness of time, yes, uh, those things came together. What happened, happened, you know. Absolutely. Minister Sandy says, God always puts us in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Nothing is coincidental. Nikki, how would you express that same thought in your life? Has it been true for you? If so, how? Have y'all ever seen Clash of the Titans? Oh, yeah. Like the old, old one. Bad graphics, everything. One of my favorite movies. So in the movie, all of the Greek <laughs> gods are up in the heavens and uh, one of the guys is maneuvering um, the people, but they look like the chessboard, right? Mm -hmm. And every time stuff like that happens in my life where I'm at the right place at the right time, just happen to sit and talk to somebody or meet someone, I think about that part of the movie. Um, I understand there's not the Greek guys doing it, but the point I'm trying to make is, is um, God's divine timing his divine appointments, his divine way of moving things around, um, moving, having you be late on purpose, because if you're late, you'll be on time to meet the right person. Um, having you not take a certain route that you would normally take so you miss an accident. Like none of those things are ever coincidental. I think that's God and him, his angels allowing us to maneuver through life to all to get us to the points and places that we're supposed to be at the right time. Mm. Is there a scripture that comes to your mind just like that when you hear this type of conversation? What are some of the scriptures that this reminds you of? All things work together. Mm -hmm. um, how God knew me before he formed me, which to me <laughs> indicates you also know everything that I'm going to do. So mm -hmm. you got all of that worked out. Mm -hmm. um, Probably because you asked me, I can't think of any other ones. But, all right. All right. <laughs> but I know there are other scriptures yeah. that definitely come to mind. Will come uh -huh. in a moment. Anybody else? Any others come to mind as you think on this? To everything, there's a season and a time. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good one. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Minister Carol, Minister Wayne, any? I think about the entire story of the woman with the issue of blood. Her her story, how twelve years Jesus mm -hmm. could have healed her long before mm -hmm. he could have done that. And I mm -hmm. think about how there was a crowd around, and and, <laughs> and she could have made her way prior to that. But Jesus had a purpose, and he had a plan that 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 particular crowd be there, and that that crowd of people be there at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And even what he said. Who touched me he knew exactly who touched him Lord. because it was a divine date with destiny mm -hmm. that particular time that that crowd and that she would be able to go out and tell what happened but there's so many things that take place i mean so many stories in the bible bible that it was predestined and ordained for it to happen at that right. particular time not a day early not a day late but right I, at that time and then all things work together all things all means all and if they work together it's got a time a season 
a place, Ecclesiastes, for everything. There's a time. Right. That's good. Right. Is, is it right. different for us? Is it what? Is it any different for us? Oh, no, it's not. That same God that that, that, that did it back then. He's the same yesterday, right. today, and So now right. we've changed, but he hasn't. Absolutely. Think about this name, too, that he gave it. He called it Redeeming Grounds. And I know he's talking about the grounds, the coffee bean, but I right. want to play that for a moment. What are some of the grounds that God wants to redeem in our lives? What are some of the grounds that God wants to redeem in our lives? Talk on that for a moment. Um, how about the relationships we have with him? And probably our lives and uh, bringing salvation or healing in certain areas of our lives, mm -hmm. redeeming certain things that we lost or went through. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that would come to mind. And also real quick, Psalms 31 and 15, my time's in your hands was with the other question that you asked previously. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yes. What are some of the other grounds that you see God wants to redeem, whether they're, they're beams or whether it's a ground we're standing on? What, what are some of the other grounds that God wants to redeem in our lives in this season? I always think that he wants to redeem. He, he presses us to redeem time, you know, wasted time that uh, uh, the, the way, um, you know, we may have spent our time foolishly and uh, when we come back into salvation or whatever, how he just really accelerates. And I think a lot of the zeal and the, the, um, the need that we have to go out to, you know, we will pay the devil back <laughs> mm -hmm. for all the things that, you know, we were out there doing or we're going to redeem the time and, and mm -hmm. we're making up for you know, in a sense, we're not really making up for it, but he, this is the stride. You know, yeah. that, you know, as hard as I served, you know, this evil one. That's that. I want to serve you even harder. Yeah. You know, as hard as I served myself, and and as much time as I spent on myself, let me give that time to God mm. now and see mm. him do the miracles, see him do the work, mm. uh, redeeming the time because the days of evil is the Bible verse that always comes to my mind. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, that's the only call to do. Yeah. I, I want to see if I'm by myself. How many of you feel like you've wasted a lot of time? A lot of time. Anybody? If you haven't, that's okay. I need, I need to know from somebody watching this broadcast, whether it's live or whether you're in a replay, <coughs> replay, I need to know if you feel like you've wasted a lot of time. Go ahead and be honest with the confession. They used to say it's not a scripture, but they say it. confession is good for the soul. I think there's some scripture on that. Confession is good for the soul, right? Uh, go ahead and put, I've wasted a lot of time. Uh, let me put my hand up there again. I've, I've wasted a lot of time. I love this. Is he wants us to the ground, redeeming grounds. Some of the ground he wants to redeem right now in this season is wasted time. Minister right. Wayne, say something. You were going to say something? Minister Wayne? No, I was saying I, I think our hearts. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yes. Yeah, no, I was saying I, I think the area... In, in the area of our hearts, um, because mm -hmm. a lot of times we 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 hold things, hold on to things that aren't necessarily meant for us to hold on to, like grudges and uh, you know Ooh. hatred and things like that, and, and all of that damages the heart, which yeah. you know, damages our souls, uh, uh, you know, overall. So mm -hmm. redeeming our hearts back to Him and, and to the things that He wants for us, um, that's just, I mean, I, I think that's an important ground for for yeah. a lot of us to really give back up or to take back my lord that's good right there uh 2019 and 20 uh pivotal opportunities for us to put out house in order through the areas of relationship to make sure we don't allow bitterness to make sure that we don't allow guilt to make sure that we don't allow hardness and animosity any of those things so that we can have what scripture says uh, clean hands and a pure heart. Because if those things are not real to us, we won't even see God moving in our own lives. I mean, everything will be, he'll be moving, but it'll be right, right past us, and we won't even be able to acknowledge that. But, so thank you for bringing that out. Minister Sandy says that was in our devotional this morning about redeeming the time, Minister Renee. Uh, Aunt Lily says, I've wasted a lot of time. Minister Ethel says, I've wasted 
a lot of time. They, they're not by, them, by themselves. Uh, the Old Testament reminds us that God is able to, to take back the year, to give us back the year. I mean, he got some stuff in there that I said, oh, I don't want to see no locust, canker worm, and all that. Right. I, 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 look, I saw some roaches back home back in the day. But, but, but he, he called out some stuff. I said, woo, I, yeah, give me back them years. I don't, want, I don't want my stuff eating up with that. So yeah, we are in a season, I believe, that if our hearts are right with God, that he will allow us to redeem that time that was lost. Yeah. Um, believe God for that. And I want to know if, if someone watching this broadcast again, if you're believing God to redeem the time in your life that you've lost, that you've wasted, if you're believing him, make that your confession tonight. Go ahead and put it in the notes. Hashtag, I'm believing God to redeem my time. I'm going to go to another quote. He says, last year they helped Colombian farmers. He's talking about this group. They help Colombian farmers in a conflict zone transition 54 acres from cocoa to coffee cultivation. He says, in doing so, they took one point, no, 1,740 kilos of cocoa paste out of production with a street value of more than $85 million. He says, what started out as a five pound <clears throat> has turned into a 500 pound lion as thousands of pounds of coffee are imported from converted farmers. When you guys read that, what thoughts went through your head? I think it's, <clears throat> I'm not sure if he says this in this chapter because I did not get a chance to read it. Uh -huh. But I think, I think him coming to the States and seeing how big the coffee business is here, mm -hmm. whether he knew he was going to need that later on when he went back or not, I think that may have also influenced his decision. Because I know that coffee's coming here. Mm -hmm. I know they're making money off of us because we drink some coffee. So yeah. I think even that will play into that business being so, so strategically um, started at that time and then being so successful because there is a great, great need for it, a yes. demand, I should say. Not a need, but a great demand for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Anybody else? I look at the five pounds of coffee <clears throat> as a seed, actually, you know, that um, Santiago, that's his name, right? Santiago yeah. took uh, to America and it was just, it was, it was a small thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we start out with um, a dream of making a change, it's not a, it's not a great big deal. It's not a great big thing. We may not mm -hmm. have a lot of money. We may not have a lot, but you have that that desire. You act on it, and you take it. So when he took that those that coffee, I looked at that as him taking the seed, and now he planted that seed in America. And all of a sudden, there's an increase because people are going to taste the taste. You know, they're tasting the coffee. Mm -hmm. Oh, this coffee is wonderful. You know. <laughs> Something was done. It's nothing. It's not. A, it wasn't a lot of coffee, like you say, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, it was all over the place. But he came with it, and then he came with an idea, something that people could get behind. That mm -hmm. look, uh, uh, you know, drugs is a problem everywhere. Yeah. And something that we can do. It's not just a cup of coffee. What you're doing is you're putting people who are killing people out of business. Mom. Um, those two things together, you know, we love coffee, but just the fact that, hey, this is such a, a great idea that we're actually doing something. Um, mm. you know, can't, we can't fly over to Colombia and burn up the fields, but what we can do is we buy this coffee and allow the people to replace it. Right. Making a difference. So absolutely. We actually latched on to that. That's so good. Let me ask you this. I got another quote I'm going to read in a moment. Here he comes with a five pound can of coffee. He's not smuggling like some others would have come with. And another occasion in that same chapter, he, he takes a video and he sends it to Pastor Mark. He's holding in his hand a brick, which is the equivalent cocaine of $27,000 street value. Takes the picture of the video, the video picture, sends it to Pastor Mark, and he and he's burning it. He's keeping the coffee, but he's burning the cocaine. Burning the cocaine. What does that What does that tell you about 
his character, and what does that tell you about money in terms of how some people see money and how some people see value that goes far past money? Can y'all speak mm -hmm. on that? That's good. His integrity. I mean, look at the integrity that he had because the money to be made, the real money, was in the cocaine. Right. And, um, you know, how many people would have just said, listen, we can all be rich. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody can be rich. We don't have to do this struggling thing. So, I mean, his integrity to, to do that, how many people would have the ability to have millions of dollars and throw that in the fire to say, no, but I have a higher calling. I have a mm -hmm. higher purpose in life. How could this message translate to many of us in our mostly urban communities where we have such a pandemic of young men, especially women too, but young men who they view that's the only way out. But here's this brother from Columbia. If anybody was going to be a kingpin, it could have been him with all, all the stuff he saw and went through. But he, he's, not, he's not bringing back the cocaine. He's bringing back five pounds of coffee and he's burning the cocaine. So what kind of message could that send to some of our young men out in our community? Yes, sir. I, I, I think that's a testament of his faith uh, in God because uh, kind of backtrack a tad bit to what you were just saying about him before. You know, $85 million being taken out of somebody's pocket is a serious slap in the face to those cartels. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, you got to realize that they don't just go after the individual. They'll right. go after the families. Right. Uh, so, you know, just understanding the situation that he was in and play, that he's placed himself in, his faith in God is immense. Uh, yeah. Knowing that God has got him and, and is protecting him and obviously has been and, and still is uh, because he's continuing to do what he's do what he's been doing, because that's what he's been called to do. And, and I think that's incredible uh, mm -hmm. seeing, you know, sometimes firsthand, basically what, uh, based on what I do now uh, and what I've, what I've done in the past, these guys don't play. Right. <laughs> so you have to have, I mean, your, your, your faith in God has to be strong, but yeah. at least he's got something there that he started with. And I think it translates to our young people uh, in our inner cities as you have to first take that, that first step of faith. Uh, right. You know, if you really want to change something and get out of it, you know, yeah. you've got to first make that first step of faith and, and moving forward to something different. Um, he didn't go into the family business as it was. You know, yeah. he, he watched his father do what he did, you know, for these guys. And he, he has father was a legitimate businessman, but he was basically controlled and told what to do by these guys. So, yeah. you know, he could have easily had probably stayed there and, and did the same thing that his dad did. But he didn't do that. You know, his, his mom took him away or whatever. And they came to America. He could have gotten right back into the same habits right Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Uh, real would have been really easy. Yeah. Minister Carroll, I want you to do this. I'm going to go through some of these comments while I'm doing it. Get ready. I want you to give a uh, 60. I can't hear you. you can't hear me? What about now? Can you hear me now? I hear you. Okay. I hear you. Minister Carroll, I want you to take 60 seconds. I'm going to go through these comments first. I want you to direct a 60 second message to some young man somewhere. Maybe they're in their uh, latter <laughs> teenage years. <laughs> in their mid twenties or early thirties. And they think that's the only thing they have to do to take care of themselves and even their families. I want you to inspire them with what you know for a fact God can do in their lives without them having to violate character and values and the integrity of the relationship with God. As you're thinking on that, let me read these comments. Kenny says, I believe God will redeem my lost time. D says, I'm believing God to redeem my time. Minister Sandy, he could have stayed where he was in fear or get up and run with his dream, even though it may have cost him everything. Yes. Mr. Ethel, I am believing God to redeem my time. Mary Mary is in the house. She says, I'm believing God to redeem my lost time. Minister Albert, good to see you, man of God. Lost a lot of time. Minister Sandy, I'm believing God to redeem my time and Minister Kelly redeeming the time. So we're all on one accord. Minister Carol, speak 
to that young man or even young woman for that matter. We know it's a pandemic. I mean, these prisons are full of young men and women with hopes, dreams, ambitions, but they have taken some, uh, in some ways, uh, a quicker path that is filled with uh, traps from the, from the enemy. Speak to that person directly for 60 seconds. What, I, what comes to mind is what's in your hand? Um, that's what God said to Moses. What's in your hand? And God has placed something in all of our hands. You know, I hear a lot of young people saying, I don't have this and I don't have that. But what do you have? God can take the smallest of things. He took a rod, an ordinary rod that looked plain to the to the eye, to the human eye, to everybody else. It was, it, let, let's go a little bit deeper. He took a stick mm -hmm. and he used a stick for his glory. He said he'd use a rock for his glory. He's put something in our hand and that thing plus God can turn into a masterpiece because that's who God has called us to be. And if we'll believe God to do what he said that he's done, not what he's gonna do, because a lot of times we'll say, God, do it. God has done it. God, let me walk in what you've already done. Help me to use what you've given me because he's given us all a tool to use. He said that your gift will make room. And by him saying your gift will make room for you, that, that we all got one. Yeah. What's in your hand? You use that thing to the glory of God and it can't help but to prosper. And to, and to, and to come out and shine. It's like my sister Nikki up there. You, you may even outshine her. <laughs> That's what we have to do. That's so all right. Whatever it is that he called you to do, do what diamonds do. They shine. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's gonna be hard, y'all. I'll shine that system, but 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 go, go on and give it your, your Sunday best anyway. <laughs> That's good. We got Catherine. She comes and she says she believes God is going to restore everything that yep. she lost. We're believing God with you. We say yes. good evening to D Shipley. We say good evening. To Queen Kathleen, we say good evening to all of those joining in with us. Y'all help us to share this broadcast. We're going to go in deeper. Let me read this next quote. Uh, it's from the storyline itself. Mark had a dream, too, and that dream ties into what we're talking about here, this uh, redeeming grounds. But Pastor Mark and the church where he pastors, they have this coffee house that they had created on Capitol Hill there in D.C., Ebenezer's Coffee House is the name of it, but they were turning, or they turned rather, what used to be a crack house. So they mm. took this crack house, now it's a X crack house, and they turned it into a coffee house, but it's not just any day, everyday coffee. It's coffee with a cause, because the whole mission of this ministry was to be able to take every single penny of profit that was earned and use it for kingdom causes. What a master mm. plan. I love the entrepreneurship and I love the ministry being combined to do greater works that God called them to do. And it just so happens that Santiago became a very valuable, as Mr. Carroll said, masterpiece in the hand of God in this. Let me give you this quote. The quote is from the same chapter. It says, what we didn't know was that our dream, and this is Pastor Mark, our dream would help fulfill the dream of coffee farmers in Colombia via Santiago. Redeeming Grounds isn't just one of our roasters. They're the middleman between our dream and the dream of courageous coffee farmers in Colombia. He goes on to say, whether you're aware of it or not, your dream is contingent upon someone else having the courage to pursue his or her dream and someone else's dream is contingent upon you pursuing yours. Those Colombian farmers needed Santi and Santi needed them. Let's just be plain and talk about this thing. Y'all let your hair down, let's talk. Who is holding you up from accomplishing your dream or who are you holding up? In other mm. words, mm. who's your Santi and who's your Colombian farmer? Mm. There have been so many times in my life I've been both. It's been it's been interchanging for me. Sometimes I've been the Colombian farmer waiting on folk. 
and hoping and praying for years and years and years and years. And then sometimes I've been the Santi, which was the answer for someone. I'll speak on the Colombian, the, the Colombian farmer. I've been praying and believing God for laborers uh, to teach and to preach and to share ministry. And I'll tell you tonight what we're seeing in this broadcast and as we have seen in many others uh, like this is a team of persons that to me, I was just that Colombian farmer praying and mm -hmm. seeing how God begins to move on those prayers and on those dreams. And I'm quite sure that there have been other people praying for me in the same, in, in the same way. So I want to, I want to hear from you. Who's your son, who's been your Santi and who's been your Colombian far, uh, farmer uh, who have, who have sometimes, to be honest, you found out later that you held them up because you wasn't doing what you really was, was supposed to do, stepping out of faith and, 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 and vice versa. Can y'all talk on that? Let your hair down. Dwayne, you too, man. Let your hair down and talk on that for a moment. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead, Minister Wayne. You got something to say. Your mouth is open. <laughs> well, I was just letting my hair down. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I, I, I think sometimes we're both. Uh, I know, I feel like I've, I've probably been both at some point in time. Um, I may be someone Santi right now and I'm probably holding up the bandwagon somewhere uh, for not chasing after some of the dreams that I have. And at the same time, uh, I feel like the Columbian farmer because I know there are some things that uh, I didn't think was gonna come to pass that because of other people, it, it has come to pass now. So, um, yeah. I, I guess I, I feel like I'm, I'm filling both sets of shoes and a lot of times not knowing in what direction completely to go with everything uh, simply because you're, I think the, the dream itself sometimes may seem a little bigger than what you're expecting it to be. And maybe I'm thinking like, oh man, this is way outside the box and this is not gonna, you know, it, it'll never work, you know, and that you have that revolving doubt about things. So kind of like, okay, well, how do I even start this? Where do I even go to, to begin to put this on the map? And that's 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 where I feel like it's at, I'm at right now with a, a, a couple of items. And it's like, okay, well, okay. I feel you. How do we launch this off? How do we get this going? I feel you. Right. Minister Carol, how, how do you respond to that? I think I've been in both. Am both. <laughs> um, I think I'm holding, maybe holding up a lot of people even now because it's things that um i could do uh and one an example um yesterday i went into a a, a, a board meeting met some people that i'd never met before i i'd already i previously met some of the new people that were chosen for the board along with myself but on yesterday i got to meet all 12 of the members on the board None of them looked like me. There were seven men, older men that looked very intimidating. And there were five women, four that didn't look like me. And then there was myself. And immediately, fear, fear overcame me to the point that I wanted to run away. <laughs> I, I really did. I, that's what I wanted to do. But I'm like, God, if you called me into this, and I know you had to call me into this, because I didn't ask for it. I didn't go looking for it. They came mm -hmm. for me. And if this is what you called me to do, then I've got to step up. I don't know what he has done in that, but I got to walk in it like I, like, like I know that he's in charge. Mm -hmm. And out of all those people, uh, previously, I had been asked to be the co-chair. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. I know nothing about it. So yesterday, I took a stand and I said, I don't have to know anything about it. God does. Amen. And if he called me amongst these people yes. to make an impact. Mm -hmm. then I'm going to set Carol down and I'm going to stand God up and yeah. stand yeah. and I'll be the best co-chair that I know how to be according to the will of God. 
So yeah. I'm not taking it until then. I, I feel like I, I held some people, but I feel like some people are going to follow. And there's going to be some more people that come along that look like me because I'm there. And I ain't going nowhere unless God pulls me out of that thing. And by the time that meeting was over, I had those older men saying, we got to get in touch with Carol Brown. Yeah. <laughs> Carol Brown. Yeah. It wasn't about me, but I give the glory to God. And I, and I went up in there it with fear, but I came out with confidence. So oh. I'm both. I, 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 I both. God can do it all. And I just want to encourage some whatever it is that God has called you to do. Remember who made the call. All you got to do is pick up. That's Come it. On. Put a hashtag on it. Put it up. Pick there. up. Remember who called you. <laughs> Hashtag pick up. Mr. Renee, does that resonate with you? What you shared? It absolutely does. When I looked at this section of the book, um, um, I thought about the circle of life, actually. You know, it really, I just looked at how each one of us affects somebody else. You know, each one, reach one, each one, teach one as we're going along. But I hadn't thought about it in terms of dreams. So when you know, you talk about a, 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 a Santi, a Santiago for me. Okay, so that would be you, um, Pastor Mel. That would be you um, uh, <laughs> for me. Uh, because um, when you reconnected, I mean, you know, I mean, I knew you as a teenager. That's fine. And um, maybe the circle of life of people, family members, what they've done for you. And, and, and you passed it on and whatever. But I never thought I wasn't looking for anybody to come back and do anything for me. Or um, I didn't have any. Um, the I written written this book. Uh, I had to dream like, okay, hope people will read it or whatever. But I didn't have any expectations for that. I didn't see how it was going to happen. And basically, I had just given up. I said, okay, well, I did that. You know, what am I going to do now? And then here you come, and okay, so you're excited about the book, and I'm looking like a little side eye. To be honest, I'm giving <laughs> you like the side eye, like, okay, you know, what's this about? You know. And, and um, you know, you 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 you're, you're talking and you know you're encouraging and you you oh wow the book is what and I said what and I'm looking back and I'm going back to read it myself to say well what, what is what what book is he reading I mean what's going on and then you you you're talking and you know what and you, and you should talk about this and I'm saying who wants to talk about this and this is what I'm saying the whole time in my mind so um, basically kicking and screaming I guess. Uh, unbeknownst to you probably you dragged me into this thing and you tell me you're gonna put me on facebook live <laughs> no i'm not going on facebook live oh yeah yeah and you're just going and going and i'm looking at whatever god put in you okay ignited something in me Amen. i was sitting there I, let me tell you something i wasn't thinking about none of this i was collecting my stuff thinking about my pension and retirement check and, you know, basically waiting to die. I didn't even think about it. You know, it wasn't... <laughs> waiting to die. If anybody said, yeah, I mean, it was my time was over. I didn't have any place to teach. I didn't have any... Um, the connections that I had were no more uh, gone or whatever. You know, God had moved me from so many things. I had been uh, giving up hope and, you know, they were diagnosing cancer and all kind of crazy stuff for me. And so I said, oh, I'm next. And really and truly, I didn't have um, I didn't have a vision for it. I really didn't. And you were talking about it. I went back and read the book because you kept talking about how great the book was. I was like, what, what's wrong with this man? And then you kept calling me. I said, why does he keep calling me? What's wrong with him? He don't have nothing to do. You know? no. I thought <laughs> It was um, so needed and, and such a genuine push. Um, I have not met many people who go out of their way to push somebody else's dream. That's generally what I do. I help, I help other people reach their goal, and then they just you know kick me to the curb, basically, when they're done. That's right, been my experience. Right. And I'm saying, why? Why? What is it? And, you know, my dad is dead. I mean, there's nothing I can do for him. What I couldn't understand, uh, uh, what what was the motivation? Mm -hmm. And the motivation was pure. It was just God using someone to reach out to me, and that was something. Um, in shoot, forty years of ministry, 
I had not seen that. Wow. I had not seen all of that. I've been wow. used. I've been used, but if somebody talked about pushing me and pushing the dream. That was <laughs> oh, that was so I think that in in the fact that I, it, it was woke up dreams that I didn't know I had. Um, it woke up a uh, little girl stuff that I used to think about a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it, the possibilities, um, I didn't have it for myself to do for me. No, um, I didn't think things I thought I would never do. This is what I'm doing right now. This is mega. You know, <laughs> my kids are looking at me like, "Will you get back on there again, again this week, you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, matter of fact, I'm running down to the Dominican salon. I'm gonna get my hair done this week. How about that? Yeah, how about that? <laughs> that part. That part. It's just amazing what um a, you what we can do and inspire me to inspire other people. Yeah. Um, to talk, encourage them. But I'm doing it now with hope for myself. Yeah. It's not just for other people or whatever. So I can't pay you for that. Uh, you know, I, I can't pay you when your good people of Joshua House of Worship went down there and I definitely expected them to be giving me the eye and looking me up and down or whatever and they just loved on me and I was like, whoa, you know, let me move to Texas, let me go. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful thing when the body of Christ works as it should be because it is a circle. It's it should be a circle. Yeah. Each one Helping somebody else. I'm gonna give you a smile. I'm gonna give you that encouragement. Yeah. Back. So that's my testimony right there. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, here's what I want to do for, for a moment. I want uh Sister Nikki and then Mr. Carol, you both and Mr. Wayne, you've read the book before. I want them to talk about <coughs> Minister Renee, how she has been a Santi through what she wrote in her book, and then meeting her when she came to Texas and y'all talked to the woman on the phone a bunch of times and all that. How, how has she been a Santi? A Santiago? No, a Santiago. <laughs> how, has, how has she been Vivian Santiago Pittman? So Her book helped walk a lot of people through some things that they didn't think they would survive. And you gave them hope to know that you can not only survive it, but you walk them through the process of how to and then how to come out on the other side. You have to understand how huge and impactful that is. You know what I mean? You gave people life and breath back. And that's huge. And when I met you, we met at First Lady's party and someone that wrote such a powerful, empowering book was one of the most humblest people that I had ever met. And you were so warm. And I just, I enjoy your whole spirit and your energy. So, you know, you have this, this you because you're such a powerhouse. You have this powerhouse about you, but then you're so loving and it's so kind. So um, you have to understand that when you sacrificed and wrote that book, you sacrificed so many people could live and many people could be free. Mm, wow. Minister Carol. Minister Renee is just just like one of my sisters. But yet your wisdom, I mean, that book, I can't even tell you what that book did for me. I I, I told you all about how during the time I was teaching how I lost my brother. Um, that book helped to awake up, to awaken so much that I had put to sleep in my life. I called it being past it, being over it. That book taught me that I was not, I had not grieved. I had not moved on. It showed me exactly where I was, and what I needed to do. A lot of it was like reading my own story. I looked at your losses and and I looked at my losses, and and, and then I and, and and I was more confident. You know, my my motto is if Carol can, but I was saying if Sister Renee can, then surely God, you'll do it for me. Yeah. And and then when I met you, I just wanted to just hold you and just keep you near to me, because I felt like if. I felt like if, 
if it rubbed off on me that I could just mm. keep it. And I, I, I wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm just telling I wanted to take you to bring you to the house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, and every Tastes time a good I plate. something that I could say, uh, <laughs> say something, <laughs> just your voice. It's, it's, it's like medicine. And that's what you do. You, 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 you the medication that you give off. And you know how this is from the heart. I, I know for a fact that you meant everything you said because you know, you know, I can I, I can discern, I can walk away and say, well, they didn't consider that. And I'm mm-hmm. God assured me your heart is genuine and pure and it's honest and it's it, it's contagious. It's just like an infection. I don't mind being infected. With what it is that God gave you, it infect me. Oh my God! For real, and I love you so very much. So let's just say there's a whole bunch of Colombian farmers, and there's a whole bunch of Santiago's and Santiago's up in here, and also out here putting in these comments. We got my girl Gina, Mama G. We love you, darling. She's all the way in the UK. Uh, I believe her daughter just got married a few days ago. Congratulations. Mama G, congratulations. Minister Sandy says, preach, Cal. Uh, I couldn't see what that says. It's whited out. Uh, Kat says, who called you? Mary says, awesome God. Ethel says, I know who called me. Mama G says, I remember who called Remember who called you. Mm-hmm. Strawberry says, when Father God wants you to be involved in something, he will have the right people to reach out to you. Minister Kelly said, yes, Minister Pittman, that's my attitude right now. Laugh out loud. Minister Ethel says, he will bring you out of your comfort zone. Yes, so, he will. <laughs> hey, we are. Says, if you it, the message will get through somehow. God never gives up on his children. Kat says, yes, Mr. Ethel. Minister Sandy says, you were called to make a difference right here, right now, Minister Pittman. Lady K sends her heart, her love. We got my other beautiful sister. This New Yorker right here has been instrumental in my life. One of my favorite role models and, and Sunday school teachers back in the day. Shout out, Mount Carmel. I love you, girl. Uh, one of the principals out there doing a great work. We're praying with you. Renee Pittman. Now, don't get those two mixed up by the name. <laughs> I have to tell you about that. But that's my big sis, Renee Pippen. She said, yep. Minister Ethel says, beautiful ladies, tears here, big love. And then Mama G says, daughter, yeah, daughter got married. There you go. Praise God. <laughs> so I got another quote for you. I want to go to another quote. He says, without his mighty men, David would have lived out his days as a political fugitive. And just mm. as David and just as David needed them, they needed a dreamer like David to rally around. Our dreams are more interconnected with one another than any of us could ever imagine. And the best way to fulfill your dream is to help others fulfill theirs. Now, here's the question. It's a million dollar question, y'all. Here it comes. How does this fly in the face of this modern era i don't need nobody but jesus attitude that we so frequently spew out of our mouths today i mean we got it on bumper stickers we got it on t-shirts it's all over social media i don't need nobody but jesus uh how, how does this fly, how does this fly in the face of that and and i need you to help bridge the gap what what's real and what's not Well, it's probably a good thing that they've admitted that they need Jesus, but we need we need other people. Um, you know, God said it himself in Genesis. This is not good for man to be alone, mm-hmm. is, which is the reason why a woman was made, you know, as, as his companion. You know, um, we, we all need somebody. Rather it be in in a, a relationship such as marriage or just as in friendships, um, sometimes the, the the best relationship some people have is 
is just good best friends, good friends that are always by their side that are there to lift them up when they're down and right. uh, help carry them through situations. Uh, some of those can be, be better relationships than their own family members. Mm. So, you know, we need, we need other people. <laughs> uh, those people that are saying all they need is Jesus are in denial. Mm. Nick, what are you oh, go ahead. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus needed 12 disciples. Excuse me. He got 12 disciples before he started ministering. I feel like I would be in good company to say that we might need somebody else. Jesus himself <laughs> said we needed Jesus, but Jesus went and got the 12. And then he had other followers on top of that. He had friends, uh, Mary, Martha, yeah. Lazarus. Yeah. All of these people that 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 were there around him, so he surrounded himself with people. So this whole thing is uh, that's it's a trick. It's a trick of the enemy, mm -hmm. and, and you know it's a lot of pride in that. You know, uh, people, or people have been disappointed and they've been hurt, and, and you know they 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 you know church hurt and and, and fam family hurt and friend hurt and so and so let us down. I don't want to be let down anymore. Yeah. So. Uh, say that you just go keep to yourself and or you get that little your little family some people just us four no more you know me and my children and mm -hmm. my house and that's it you know whatever but that's that's just really um just just born out of bad relationships Ooh. And bad relationships mm -hmm. um and trusting people mm -hmm. the secret to getting beyond that is to trust god if you trust god you can't be disappointed because people are people they're going to do what they do mm -hmm. you know we're all fallible, you know. We yes. we'll hurt one another. You Absolutely. know, we're going to disappoint one another. We don't let each other down. But if you trust in God, and it, He's always got our back or whatever, and we can forgive. We can go forward, being mm. again like Jesus, going back to that example. Mm. I mean, who was more let down than Him? <laughs> yeah, good. Nigga, look like you' about to say something. I was, I wish you said that's Christian and church PTSD. <laughs> but but it has, we need a we need a t-shirt <laughs> right quick. What's that? I like that one. <laughs> but in answer to your question, I give you Ecclesiastes 4, 9 okay. through 12. Okay. Two are better than one because mm -hmm. they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, mm -hmm. one can help the other up. But pity anyone who fa who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That'll be my answer. My love. Good. Man. Good. Good. Yes, these four, nine through 12. Yes. Beautiful. I want everybody to be challenged tonight, watching the replay or live. Study up on that. Hashtag this right quick. Don't give up on people. Yeah. You know why? Because God is going to use people to take your life to the next level. Yes, you're going to have some devils trying to get up in there. <laughs> but there's going to be some angels. What does he say? Watching over you. It right. can't round about those who fear God. If you fear God, if you really stand in reverence of respect for God, he'll always have enough angels in your life but the devil really can't do you no harm. And even if he does, what Minister Carroll said is true, he'll take all of that and work it together yeah. for good. Amen. Listen, for the time, I got to go to this next section. It's called Dream Jealousy. And my God, you're talking about shouting right there. Now, we don't have time to read through all the text, but I want to give you Genesis chapter 37. And I want you to read it for some homework tonight in Genesis 37 verses 1 all the way to verse 11. You're going to go to the, 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 real, the real background of the storyline of the man of God known as Joseph. Not only are you going to read about Joseph the dreamer, but you're going to re read about his brothers, the haters. So you got Joseph, the dreamer, and you got his brothers, the haters. And sometimes they can go together. And here's what he says. Here's the quote. He says, your dreams will inspire many people, no doubt. But your dreams will also summon opposition. He says, why? Because you are disrupting the status quo. He says, your dreams will cause a wide variety of reactions. 
including jealousy and anger. Some people might even want to kill you because of them. Now, for the sake of time, we didn't read through the passage, so I need y'all to read up now on Genesis 37 and read all the way from verse 1 all the way down to verse 11. Make sure you really understand it real good in your spirit. I want to ask you first on this panel, how real is it that sometimes the people that you would expect to support, to respect, to honor, and to work with you on certain things, sometimes, not all the times, thank God, sometimes those are the main ones to put heavy weights on your back. How, how, how real has that been in your own experience? Pastor, can I say this real quick before I bust? Of course, go right ahead. Don't bust them. Don't bust so I challenge us as we read what Pastor just said, Genesis 37, 1 through 11, to not see his brothers as haters, but to see them as deliverers. I'm going to tell you why. Remember Joseph's dream. Remember Joseph, his dream. The brothers doing what they did ultimately did deliver him to where he needed to be. Mm -hmm. So you got to you got to start seeing people differently in the roles that they play in your life. Because if you see them as haters, you spend too much time and energy focusing on the negative. If you see them as, oh, oh thank you, Lord. Y'all remember how, Ju how Jesus kissed Judas? Yeah. He kissed him. That was a yeah. betrayer. But yeah. he kissed him. Why? Because he, that's the role he had to play. That's right. He, he had to play that role. He was a deliverer as well. So I challenge us to see things that happen that seem negative, that seem like a setback. The people that don't support you or feel like they're hating and standing in your way, see them as the deliverers that they are. Because maybe them not helping you will make you go and go study harder, go learn how to do it yourself, go ask somebody else. Whatever it is that they're doing or not doing is meant to happen so you can get to where you have to be. So I challenge us to look at them as deliverers and not haters. Girl, that's a t-shirt, some hat socks and everything else. Hashtag don't see haters, see deliverers. Hashtag don't see haters, see deliverers. That's good to me. Big sis looked like you were gonna you was gonna speak on that. I saw something about to drive. I'm 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 all keyed up here with with, with Sister Nikki, but I, I was just thinking as she was talking, she hit on it. Well, I was gonna say, you know, Jesus was crucified because he was disruptive, mm, and yeah. dreams yeah. are always disruptive to the environment of what's going on. It's something that you're doing is always going to disrupt somebody's environment, mm. and it's provoking. I was thinking about him even as he gone. Uh, as, as you were forming that question, um, the people that should have been, he's here, he's trying to bring, not talking about Jesus now, not Joseph, but here Jesus is trying to bring heaven to earth mm -hmm. and the people who should be uh, in place and position to receive him and know the word, know every dot, every, every, every word, every line, every comma, every period in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are the very ones who are there to crucify him and take him out. Why? Because what he's bringing, the truth that he's bringing, and sometimes we are so called, our dreams are coming to bring a greater truth. God is coming to bring something to the earth that people need that was never there before. And we looking at it maybe as a little something that we're doing or whatever. You know, Minister Carol was talking about, you know, they're on her work or whatever, mm -hmm. what she's doing. She doesn't have no idea of, of what it is she's going to bring. She, she's talked about it victoriously, but it's such a greater glory. It's yeah. a right. greater than what she's doing. When we do what right. we're supposed to do, that God has sent us out there to do. So here Jesus comes in and they crucified him because he was disruptive. You messing up our plans. We got stuff here the way we want it. <laughs> right. And, and here you come, here you come with this, you go explain the scriptures and talk about God. <laughs> and you messing up our, you know, you messing right. up our the, the, the gist of the story with the Colombian drug dealers, hmm. you know, the same thing. This is the, the disrupt the the making of 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 of, of something else mm -hmm. outside of what the status quo intended it for it to be. Yeah. Know? So I was I was uh, yeah absolutely. We look at these haters. You look at these people, and and I looked at it until Sister Nikki just reminded me. I'm looking at like, yeah, Jesus and all these people, they crucified Jesus, but had Jesus Christ not been crucified, none of us would be redeemed. Oh my God. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. 
Let, let, looking like that, that's, that's power, that's power, and that and that thought right there, that's the renewing of your mind, sure enough. Because you look at it like that, the devil can't do nothing with that. Come I on. Love Come I on. love what Nikki said because when we get that right perspective, <laughs> not only do we see them as necessary and essential, it keeps yeah. us in the spirit of being grateful that God yeah. is working on our story to get us where he wanted us to be in the first place. It's really, it really boils down to trusting God. Hmm. I trust him in the light because I see everything. Yeah. But it's dark now and I don't see. Do I still trust him? Hmm. Am, am I going to walk on what I see or can't? Or am I going to walk on what God already said? And if I'm yes. going to walk on what God already said, he's not changing his mind. He's not a man that he should lie, yeah. a son that, she, that he should yeah. repent. He, he, whatever he said, that's what it is. He, yes. meant, he said it, and it ain't going to change. So the thing of it is, if I just keep and hold to what God said, no matter what folk do or don't, I'm going to be all right, and you're going to be all right. Nikki, that was that was brilliant. That was bread from heaven. Thank you. We, go go all, God. we all going to get T-shirts with that up there. So <laughs> let me ask you. They're not haters. They're deliverers. But let's deal with the critic. Uh, is all criticism and all critics to be rejected? What's the wisdom on that? How, how are we to handle critics and criticism? What are some of the the, the righteous rules? Because there are some unrighteous rules too. Yeah. What are, well, first, what are the unrighteous rules to handling critics? And then what are the righteous rules to handling critics? Y'all talk on that. <laughs> we'll let Mr. Carol go first. Oh, really? <laughs> I truly believe that um, you always compare what people say to what God says. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, does it line up with what the word of God says? And that way you can discern whether or not. I think a, a lot of our problems is that we're listening to the wrong people. My mother mm -hmm. used, to, uh, used to say that you can't stop people from talking, but right. you can be wrong. And so um, people will always tell you that you can't do what they're not willing to do. And so it, it, you just have to know. You got to know, not just know and know. You got to know that you know that you know that God called me to this. So he's going to see me through. And, and, and I welcome criticism. And the reason that I welcome it is because. I'm gonna always. It's like putting it in that in that sifter. I used to watch my mom sift that that flour, and and, and what wasn't supposed to be in there, it it stayed in that yeah. sifter, and we threw it out. But what yeah. got through was supposed to get through. I mean, we got to we got to compare that to our own life. We got to filter that thing against the Word of God, and what resonates, what we can use, use it. What you can't do. Throw that stuff out. Our problem is we keep too much of that negativity mm. and we carry it around and we never release it. And it don't line up with what the word of God says. Mm. It doesn't line up. And if it lines up, you use it. If it don't, you throw it right back to the person that threw it at you. My, my, mm. my. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> What are some of the unrighteous rules and the righteous rules concerning critics and criticism? No, I guess some of the unrighteous rules uh, <laughs> you have a tendency to go ask Pookie and then many times something <laughs> instead of, and I apologize if someone has a relative name Pookie. I have yeah, one. Yeah, I think Pookie's up here right now watching. <laughs> look, it, Pookie and them. Pookie's not always right. He, he has <laughs> bad advice. And that's not always. Hold on, he said he ain't always wrong either though. <laughs> But, but if, if I have to agree with uh, Miss Carol, when uh, when you get criticized, you have to line it up with God's word. And uh -huh. if, if it lines up, if what was said lines up with God's word, then there's some changes that you need to make in order to, to be right. Um, if it doesn't line up, then it's someone's opinion or they're disappointed, jealous mindset or whatever of why they're throwing whatever they're, I don't know, they have kids say throwing shade. Uh, at you about stuff, you know, so yeah, I mean, but those are the reasons and, and things that happen, and you gotta go, well, how do I weigh this out? But you can't take those things to heart. If it don't line up with God's word, it ain't nothing you should be worried about. And if it does, then you really need to kind of 
yeah, I mean, I just want to turn around and thank the person because it's like, okay, hey, you put a spotlight on this for me and mm-hmm. help me call, call, call out something that I need to correct. You know, mm-hmm. and so you know, I, and, and hey, thank you. Let me, let me, let me, let me correct this and go on about my business now. But <laughs> that's yeah. good. I love that. Right. I love that. There's another quote, yeah. and I'm gonna move quickly because we got two more sections, and it's powerful the way he ends this. I don't want anybody to miss this. I want to <laughs> thank everybody on the broadcast watching. Just these pearls of wisdom that are being shared. I hope it's been a blessing to your life already. But we got just a little bit further to go, so please bear with us. If you have to come back, make sure you finish. Watch the replay in its entirety. There's going to be some challenges on the end because God is not through with you. I want to know if you got a five pound uh, uh, dream or if your dream is just a few ounces, whatever it is, <laughs> God is not through with you and God wants to do so much more. So with that being said, here's a quote. A compliment, this is what Pastor Mark says, a compliment from a fool, this is how he handles criticism. A compliment from a fool is really an insult. And an insult from a fool is really a compliment. Make sure you consider the source. I need to say that one more again. A compliment from a fool is really an insult. And an insult from a fool is really a compliment. Make sure you consider the source. And I think that lines up with what Minister Carol is saying. Yeah. You know how to, you get to sift through some stuff. Find out is this a person with wisdom? Or is this a person who's just another fool? And look, if it's a fool, you already know what to do, right? You should anyway. Don't, don't, don't be two of them, right? Let that fool by themselves. But if it's someone who's wise, then it would be wise on our part to take what they're saying from the word of God and filter it through and use what is applicable to our lives and then to discard the rest. So I, I love that. Right. A compliment from a fool is really an insult and an insult from a fool is really a compliment. Make sure you consider the, the source. Shout out to my main man, my baby boy, James Outlet is in the house. That's Plucky Jr., y'all. Y'all give him some love. Uh, thank you for your service out there in the United States, huh? Amen. The next section is called Measured in Dollars. It comes from Acts chapter 19. For the sake of time tonight, I'm not going to read through it, but I want to challenge everybody on this broadcast. Here's your homework. Read Acts, the 19th chapter, all the way from the 11th verse, all the way down to verse number 20. And you're going to find out that God wasn't playing with folk. There was some stuff going on and folk faking the funk, as we say, (laughs) trying to act like they knew God and they really didn't. And the devils knew they didn't know God. And the devils dealt with them directly, uh, and uh, it didn't go so good. But on the end of all of that, a number of persons were delivered, set free, and uh, they took things that were their old lifestyle, their old habits, and the things that they were addicted to. They made a bonfire. They put it all together, and they burned it all up. And that was their form of repentance, burning up the things that they did not want to live that old life again. So they got rid of the day Christians just, you know, we just go to church one or two times and think that, you know, that's repentant. Yeah. But they, they burned up some stuff uh, in the past. Now, the author took liberty and he took the economic measurements from what they burned up then, 2,000 years ago, to the present moment. And it was valued at, in today's economy, over $12 million worth of possessions were burned. And they burned them as a community because they said, we don't want to live that life anymore. We right. want to give our life to Christ. We want to, we want a new life. Could I ask y'all tonight, not the panel, but this is just rhetorical almost. What are you burning? What are you burning? Or what's that burning? Somebody put that in the comment. What's that burning? What's that burn? Something should always be burning. If it's, if it's from our past, we gave our life to Christ today. If it's from our past and it didn't represent God, it didn't glorify God. It doesn't bring him any praise. It doesn't help anybody to know him. There's some things that should be burning. See, if there's a burning on the inside of us, there has to be some burning of some things that maybe we got it in a closet. Right. Maybe it's in the trunk of the car. Maybe it's in our wallet. Maybe it's something somebody's number in our phone. I don't know. Whatever it is, it needs to be burned. They burned over 12 million dollars worth of stuff because they said give me jesus yeah give me jesus i gotta burn some stuff and give me me jesus so 
with all of that said, I want to I want to read one more quote and then I'm going to ask some questions on that. He says sometimes faith can be measured in dollars. Then he hmm. says there comes a moment in every dream journey when you have to put your money where your dream is. It might be a $50 date. It might be a $100 application fee. He says it might be a $500 plane ticket or $2,000 lease. Think of it as a down payment on your dream. So he takes all of that story and he shows us in the book of Acts that they burned some stuff because that was the price they were willing to pay to live out their dream and their vision with God, this risen savior that, that they had just heard about. They were willing to get rid of, make sacrifices. And it was, it, it lost money. It was lost money. It's just like Santiago when he burned that brick. That was $27,000 burned right. up in smoke. And it wasn't even his money. <laughs> so, so, look, it show sure enough was dangerous for him to do that, but yet he did it. Because every time you have a dream in God, it's going to cost you something. Yeah. So let me ask the panel, this This is the few questions. What happens to dreams that we won't invest in ourselves? I need to hear from y'all. What Ooh. happens? to dreams that we won't invest in ourselves. Who wants to go first? They die. Yep. That's right. What happens? They die. Or they're not they're not completely seen to the full fruition. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes God will give them to someone else. Woo! I don't, sometimes they don't die. Uh, so, because sometimes he gives us the dream, and if it's not manifested in us, he can pass it on to the next generation or to someone else who will fulfill that dream. Right. So it, it, just, it, 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 it depends. That's good. I, I, yeah. I made both of those statements. Yes, they do die to us. We become dead to it. But I love how Minister Carol brought that out. Sometimes because we have failed to believe God. He has to pick someone else. Right. I mean, we, we got a king here, uh, Saul, right? And he lost and he was replaced by yeah. someone after God's own heart. And these are how we see so many people, generations sometimes. Sometimes one generation didn't get. It could be a whole generation of folk. And that generation right. has to die out before they can cross over to what God wants because we they didn't pay the price or we didn't pay whatever the price is that God said that we needed to pay. Anybody else on that? What happens to dreams that we don't invest in ourselves? Anybody else? Here's another one. Why do so many people treat a dream like a lottery ticket? <laughs> Why do so many people treat a dream like a lottery ticket? I, I think they missed the point that you have to, uh, it requires work. It's gonna cost you something. There's no dream. It's not gonna cost you something. Um, you have to go through the process in order for that dream to be manifested, no matter what it was. And with Joseph, the process he went through was all the things he had to endure to get to that point where he actually was elevated to, to see his dream come to pass and his brothers come to bow before him. You yeah. know, he had an idea what that, what that process was going to be, and sometimes we don't either. But sometimes God will give us a dream and it's going to cost us at least, if nothing else, it's going to cost us that faithfulness yes. or something. Sometimes we'll give you a dream. I mean, um, about, about four weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, you know, God told me to go get my passport. Now, I haven't had a passport in over 20 something years or whatever. Mm -hmm. Go get your passport. Get my passport for what? I don't like to, anybody to tell you, I don't like to travel. I'm good at home. <laughs> I'm good. I, I don't have to go anywhere. Or whatever, but he said, Go get the and it was just on me, go get the passport. And I went, and I said, I don't really have the money for that right now. There's the other things I could do with the money, but I went and got the passport. Now, something is going to happen with that passport because anytime he tells me, that, I know that it's going to happen or whatever. It may not be what I'm thinking in my mind, I want to do right now because I can't think of what in the world I would need a passport. <laughs> yeah, no, and it has to do with. The dreams that I have, right. the things that he's put into me for me to do. It has to do with it. How right. it has to do with it, how it's going to get together, 
I don't know, but you have to make that investment in yourself. Yeah. You know, want that better job? Um, stop sitting on your job. And I just feel led to say this. I don't know who I'm talking to. But stop mm -hmm. sitting in your job or your place of business or in your home or whatever, waiting for your boss to send you to a class or send you the training. Or what. Invest in yourself. Good God. You know, in, in, invest in you. You know, stop waiting for it sitting in church and you waiting for, you know, your pastor to, to see your gift for somebody else to come and, you know, you know, put hand you some money to do this. And invest in you. Invest in yeah. yourself. Invest in your education. Invest in how you look. Invest in how you present yourself. Invest in how you wear your clothes. Invest in yourself. Get up every morning and say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and I'm worth the investment. Yeah. And if you start really playing that mantra over and over in your head or whatever, your dream, you you know, uh, I have a relative who he has so many dreams and every time he's, he's always inboxing somebody trying to do a GoFundMe page or mm. something great he want to do. And I said, big, big old grown man, I'm not going to fall with you. You sit up there in your house looking at your dream. Get on out here and get a job. <laughs> do something to make that dream come true. Uh, yeah, but, it's, 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 but you, they don't get it. You know, it's like I'm talented, so somebody should invest in me. It's no. the mindset. I'm Lock. beautiful, so somebody should appreciate me. You right. know, I look good. Somebody should. No, it, no, no. It no. don't work. Like that. You. Do the work. Have mercy. Do the work. Y'all heard a hashtag do the work. <laughs> hashtag it don't work like that. Hashtag <laughs> invest in yourself. <laughs> And sometimes we, we, what you just said, we want everybody else to invest <coughs> in us, and we haven't put we it on ourselves. Yeah, right. So Why yeah. expect someone else to invest in us if we won't? Right. And then I think what it is is we 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 have to learn to see the worthiness of ourselves, and the worthiness in ourselves is not even of ourselves, but it's from God. But because yeah. God put it on us and in us, he wants us to see ourselves the way he does. Right. Yeah. He don't want us looking at ourselves like trash and filth and dirt. God doesn't get, listen, I got three children and, and, and three grandchildren, and I don't want either one of them ever to look at themselves as less than. Right. Or not enough. Right. <laughs> I know I'm flawed. And sometimes they get on my last, last, I mean, my last nerve is gone and they don't got on another. But God is gracious and loving, and long suffering. And when he looks at us, he looks at, looks at us so differently than we think he does. He is not out to get us. He is not out to destroy us. He wants us to have life yeah. and have that more abundant. Yeah. So when he gave, us, he gave us that worth, he wants us to see that worth. Yes, ma'am. I want to add something to Minister Renee said. Now, for some people that won't get up and invest in their own dream, okay, we'll set that aside as being lazy. But I think some people are wanting other people to invest in us and to come on and help us because we want so desperately and secretly for them to see and believe in us what we won't see and believe in ourselves. True. So if I can get Minister Carroll and I can get Minister Wayne on board, Y'all will believe more than I do. And you'll get in and you'll do the work. But if I get up and I invest in myself, that means something in me has to believe and I just can't or I just won't or I don't think that I'm good enough. So I just wanted to add that to what she said. Like when we get to a place where we start to believe in our in, in ourselves, as um, Minister Wayne said earlier, that the, the guy had to believe in God to have enough faith to burn that brick. But he also had to have enough faith in himself too. He had to believe in enough in that dream to say, I'm going to sacrifice this brick and let this brick go for this dream over here. We got to get to that point where we believe and have that much faith in ourselves. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. I'm going to give everybody a rhetorical question. I'm just going to finish it up in the next 12 minutes here. Uh, here's the rhetorical question. I want you to consider this. Maybe write a note down on it. Ask this question of yourself and answer it for yourself. You don't have to put it in the comments, but I really <coughs> think heavily on it. If you measured your dream in dollars, are you fully invested or underinvested? Mm -hmm. If you measured your dream in dollars, and when I say dream, I'm talking about what God gave you as it relates to vision for your life, not some whatever. 
you know that it's God ordained. If you measure your dream in life, what, what God put you on this earth to do, your purpose, your assignment, if you measured your dream in dollars, are you fully invested or are you under the under invested? In other words, have you put enough in that you're showing the Lord as well as yourself and others connected that you really believe that God gave you this, that you made sacrifices? Come on, of some in God we trust type of stuff. Have you put that into it? Are you fully invested? Or are you underinvested? You don't have to answer that for us. You don't have to put it in the comments. But before the end of this year, you need to have a talk with Jesus on that. Are you fully invested or are you underinvested? The last two sections in this chapter, the next one is called Dream Markers. I want to move through that because it's powerful. And then we're going to close out on that last section, which is called Pay the Price. And, and Dream Markers, very short but powerful. Here's the quote. He says, in every dream journey, there is a point of no return. It's a decision that cannot be undone. Sometimes it's a rule you break. Sometimes it's a risk you take or a sacrifice you make. Here's the question. What dream marker resonates with your spirit the most and why? I'm going to give you some dream markers from scriptures where there were some people who came to a point of no return. They couldn't go back. They broke rules. They took risks. They made sacrifices. I want to ask you which one resonates with you the most and why. Here it is. Here they go. Number one, Abraham took his son Isaac to an altar. Uh, it was his only begotten son. He had waited a long time. Dream marker number one. Dream marker number two, Moses. Hmm. He doesn't listen to God and God done got him in trouble. Pharaoh's army is behind him. The Red Sea is in front of him. It's a dream marker. Number three, Rahab with those spies. She was making good money in the city. She was doing what she was doing. She had been doing it. But now all of a sudden, she's going to put her reputation on the line and take the risk. But some folks, she really doesn't know them. She heard of them. She doesn't know them. And she supported. She helped the spies, Rahab and the spies. Number four, David and Goliath. I don't have to say anymore. Y'all know the story. That was a point of no return. I don't want your armor. I'm going to use what God gave me to use. I got this sling and the five smooth stones. Queen Esther, her uncle told her, born for such a time, time is this. as this. Yeah. Actually, Peter, come. You, you, you Come on. You bad. Come on. And he got up out of that boat and he walked on a liquid sidewalk, y'all. <laughs> Marker speaks to you the most, resonates with your spirit the most. And tell us why. I would say Rahab. Okay. I, I wouldn't say she necessarily. Well, yes, I can't say that. Never mind. I would say Rahab mm -hmm. because her her spiritual, I mean, her marker was sacrificing her life to help other people. Mm -hmm. And I almost said I can't relate to that, but that's a lie. Because mm -hmm. my life is about helping other people. So that would be the one that I would use is Rahab. I love it. I love it. Mr. Wayne? Uh, I would say Peter, stepping out of the boat. Uh, and I feel it's just like it's it's something I feel like God is calling me to do and <clears throat> being told to step out of the boat. But I'm still busy looking at the waves right now. So uh, <laughs> a little hesitant about stepping out of that boat. Yeah. All right. All right. Minister Carroll? I'll say uh, David and Goliath mm -hmm. because uh, I've had so many obstacles that I've had to overcome. And um, God has, every time, he's given me just the right sling. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I see myself as That's David. Good. Wow. I love that. And before I go to Big Sis, I'm going to go to these comments and I want to, I want her to have hers ready because I want to challenge everybody watching this broadcast live or replay. I want to know which one speaks the most to you. I want to give you the names again. I want to know if it's uh, your dream mark is Abraham and Isaac and son Isaac, Moses with Pharaoh, Rahab with the spies, David with the Goliath, Queen Esther with the king, or Peter with the sidewalk uh, that uh, that was uh, something that he needed to walk on when everybody else said, man, fool, don't go out that boat. So which mm -hmm. one is yours? 
Which one is yours? I need to hear in the comments. Y'all talk to us. Which one is yours? Sis, tell us what, which one is your, your mark that shows you that it resonates with you. No point of return. And I feel that, that that's in me. Which one stands for you? I'm going to say Abraham with Isaac. And I'm going to say it because, wow, for you to believe God for 75 years for a thing. And God give it to you. And um, you raise it up. You love it. You are just, this is, this is, your heart is here. And then God say, go up on that mountain and take that thing that you waited for all that time. Lay it out here and sacrifice it. Give it back. Sacrifice it to me. Mm -hmm. Call it for something that, um, you know, it, that kind of a call would almost want you to rebuke it. I mean, you know, <laughs> Lord, you say, you know, that can't be God telling me mm -hmm. to sacrifice this thing that I waited so long for, prayed for, and hoped for, and believed him for, mm -hmm. and then I say, give it back to me. Um, yeah. That to me resonates. That that resonates hard with me because um, um, I've had I've had a couple of experiences. For sake of time, I wouldn't go into that. But I mean, I, I this have definitely had a child that you know was very very ill, and mm -hmm. uh, this child coming even having her was uh, life threatening for me. You have her and you know loved her so much. And uh, then you turn around and she got very sick and I, I couldn't get the fever down and nobody could get the fever down. So I'm there praying and she's about maybe three or four. And, you know, God is saying like, you know, uh, I'm saying, God, I need you to heal. And he said, you're going to give it to me, uh, uh, give it to me. And I, I'm holding her. Right. And I mean, and I'm just sitting up all night with her. He said, give it to me. And I and I'm saying, you're going to take her. I'm, I'm talking to God. Are you, you going to take her? Are you going to heal her? You know, he didn't give me no answers. Just every he get quiet, he would be give it to me every time I prayed. It was like, you gonna give it to me? I didn't trust him for. It took most of the night. I'm going back and forth. Well, wait a minute. Tell me what you are gonna do? Wow. Before I say give it to you, because I know you. You you be done took her, and I'll be sitting up here and right. my mindset. Right. So I believe God, although I was saved, although I was teaching, although I was ministering. Uh -huh. That 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 touched a part of me. So uh -huh. finally, the fever she just got so so sick, and I just began to weep. And I said, "Well, God, you know, I I I just have to trust you." Now I'm at the end of my rope, you know, take or whatever. Now he healed the child, uh -huh. but that was a uh, that was that was hard for me right there. And that's how I learned something else, uh -huh. you know, about myself. Uh -huh. Uh, and I learned about how much trust I didn't have in God, mm. for instance. And I'm being transparent to say, yeah. you know, sometimes we say, oh, I trust God mm. until it's really, it's really something that he's touching that thing that, you know, you really love and you're going to give it to me. Mm. I was like, nah, nah, I, I ain't giving you nothing till you tell me, tell me first. what you're about to do. Right. About God, you know, the conversation that we had and no well, that he's sovereign and everything else but none of that made a difference that, mm -hmm. that's, that's where i was so you know I, I just thank god for that experience but i always think when i think about abraham yeah he, he didn't withhold his son and actually open the door for god to sacrifice his son because they were in covenant relationship that's what's so heavy about that that mm -hmm. you know god said whatever you do for me i'll do for you so right. Time to sacrifice his son. It was a done deal because Abraham had already showed him. My you God. Know, My God. That is I so good to me. For you. Since you just opened up all kind of understanding on that, thank you for allowing God to use you. Because we like to think of ourselves as those who have trusted God so much in every way. But there are times when we're up in our faith and there are times when we're down. There are times like Peter where we're commended by God. And there are times. Like Peter, we're being rebuked by God. And there are times when we're like the man that says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And we need more transparency in that. And that's back to one of the things Sister Nikki said. Sometimes it's got God using that threefold cord and, and having someone to lift us up. Because when we're down in that position with our faith, someone who really knows us can help to inspire and build us up. So we got to be vulnerable of don't always be acting like we got it all together. Don't always be acting like 
you know, because you the pastor, that means you you pastoring everybody at all times. Sometimes you being pastor. Right. By some stuff or whatever right. term or title you want to put on it. You know, you the parent. Sometimes you're gonna be the child, you because your children about to teach you some stuff, <laughs> whether you know it or not. So, so we 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 have we have not arrived, and we are all supposed to be disciples as we students. And if we're to be that, then God has space to work in our life. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's powerful. Go to some of these comments, and then I'm gonna go on this last part. I think Renee, she says, preach, amen. Do the work. Invest in yourself. Y'all are helping me. See ourselves like he does. Amen, sis. Amen. Me, she says, amen. Waving back with much love. God bless. Minister Sandy, Esther, if, if I, I perish, perish, I perish. I perish. That's, That's one of my favorite lines. Hey. That's powerful right there. She yes. preaching good. Cam says all above. <laughs> Lord help us. And then my dad says, I hope he showered up and took that medicine. He says, not to be different, but I see no difference in either one. Well, just pick your favorite. Pick your, you gotta have a favorite. Gotta have a favorite. He getting no, y'all. He getting 83. Y'all understand. So listen, <laughs> let me move on to this last part. It's called. Well, let me give you the quote, and then I'm gonna go give you this last part. The quote is this: every dream has a price tag. There's a dream tax too. And don't forget all the hidden costs. But a God-sized dream is worth every penny every second and every ounce of energy then he says how much is your dream worth i want to read that one more again every dream has a price tag there's a dream tax too and don't forget all the hidden cost but a god-sized dream is worth every penny every second and every ounce of energy how much is your dream worth i want to just ask one question and then i'm going to move to this last section which is called pay the price. Here's the last question of what we were just talking about, dream markers. What are some of the hidden costs uh, that we often have to deal with when it comes to following the dream of God in our life? What can be some of those hidden costs? And, and I want to ask you this question for the benefit of someone watching, listening tonight, or whenever they listen. Um, sometimes, they, you know, they're analytical minds, and they're very logical on things, and you know, they've been, been very neat and tedious and tidy, and you know, they dotted every I and they've crossed every T. They got all the pay and they got it all written out. What's been your experience with the dream? Are there hidden costs? Cost of loss of relationships. Mm. There's the cost of time and sleep. Mm. Your reputation. And sometimes people think you're crazy for what you're doing. Oh, that's that's hidden right there. I didn't think they were gonna call me crazy. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Your own family will call you crazy. You'll call yourself crazy sometimes. All right, Mr. Way. What's some of the hidden calls? Uh, I, I would think some of the sacrifice i mean everyone always assumes that there's some form of sacrifice or sacrificial cost in, in uh chasing your dreams but we may not consider exactly what those things that we're sacrificing are going to be mm. and that's not that's true Mr. Carol? It costs so much sometimes it can even cost our lives wow uh, that's what it costs Jesus cost him mm -hmm. very long. He was willing to lay it down, mm. even though he got it back. And that's how we, we need to live. It, even if it cost us everything, God will give us double for our trouble. I think of our Martin Luther King, his dream cost him his very life. Yeah. But God, yeah, and he, God has a purpose and he has a plan. And if we trust him, even in that, mm. even in death, we still have the victory if we're doing it according to the will of God, doing what He said to do, and we yeah. got to be willing to lay down our very life. Yeah, that's powerful. You know, Ashley, go right ahead. In Luke fourteen, you know, um, Luke fourteen, right between <laughs> about twenty eight and thirty, um, you know, Jesus is talking about that nobody goes to build uh, an edifice or whatever without first without counting the cost. Yeah, and, and, and you know that that just says to me, you know. 
you know, I, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to do this at any cost. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about discipleship. So he's pushing us to say, well, I'm yours, God, no matter what the cost is. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm all in. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to pay this price, no matter what this price is. You know, and it's the same thing when he gives us a dream, when we, mm -hmm. we have our dreams. Don't, when we come to, to the fruition of our dream, we have to be able to say, listen, whatever the price is, I'm going to pay it to see this dream come to pass. I'm all in. I'm not 50% in. I'm not a little in. I'm not that much in. I, I'm all in. And no matter what the cost is, I'll pay it. You know, that, that's what that chapter is. That is so powerful. And that's a good segue right into this last section, which is called pay the price. Somebody put that in the comments. Hashtag I will pay the price. Well, you got to count the cost, but after you count that thing, you got to pay the price. And then you need to understand there's going to be some hidden factors there. There are going to be some things that come up that you didn't expect. You just didn't know it. But if you're fully committed, you got to have a no matter what type of thing in your spirit. Yeah. Hashtag no matter what. That's what you need in your spirit right now. In this season, you got to commit to this. Lord, I will pay the price. Lord, I will pay the price. And it will not be on sale. It will not be discounted. You will have no coupon. You have to pay the price for whatever it is that God assigned for your life. And there's going to be some hidden costs. And sometimes it could very well cost our life. But if your life is hidden in Christ, when we go to him, he'll make sure that it's been worth it, everything that we invested. Here it is. Next quote in section, the last section, pay the price. He says, one of the defining moments in our dream journey as a church was the decision to start giving to missions before we were self-supporting. Man, I could stay on this all day and all night. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to ask y'all a couple of things. <laughs> Here we go with it. Because here it is, I can see him and his church staff working with the numbers, working with the budget, and they're having these conversations, and most of them are probably saying, Pastor, ain't no way in the world we're going to be able to get to that. That, the, that don't add up. That's that's not in the budget. And they're working and they're praying and they're doing whatever they need to do to come to some kind of consensus on it and some kind of agreement and some kind of unity. And at some point, they have to make the decision that even though they can't afford it, that God has called them to give to missions, even though many of them are looking like they the mission. Like, we don't need help. How are we going to help somebody else? And we need help ourselves. Right. So here's the question. How logical is it to have this experience that you step out on faith to pay the price to give to others when you need something yourself? When, when you look at it on paper, <laughs> And it just doesn't, I'm talking to somebody out there, I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. It just doesn't add up on paper. When you look at this thing and you just say, ain't no way in the world I'm going to do that. How do you respond to that when you know that it's God telling you what to do? How do you pay the price even when you really don't even have it to be paid? I want to hear from you guys. Real quick. Uh-huh just do because we believe that that god's got it uh if, if you know that it was god ordained and it's him telling you to do it then whatever you think you're going to be lacking you're not going to be lacking and, and and i can speak on that as testimony because that's that's something we've done in our past and in, in, in present it, when, it, when it when that call comes through you just do you, you, you count the cost and you say okay well this is what it is if we don't completely have it, it's like, well, we have it, but we might be a little short over here. Mm -hmm. You know what? We're going to trust that God's going to gonna cover it and it's going to take care of itself. And we do. And when we do, next time the check comes around, oh, look, they gave me an extra blah, blah, blah. Mm. Or what? I have no idea. It's there. <laughs> Mm. I'm not even going to argue the point. And it's like, thank you, Lord, and move on. Mm. God yeah. covers it in every aspect, and it's 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 it, it's it's mind blowing to me, honestly. It, it's it's not because I'm I'm a numbers type person where if you can show it to me, then I can do it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but the math don't make sense. <laughs> mm. 
Put that in there, y'all. Hashtag sometimes the math doesn't make sense. Hashtag sometimes the math doesn't make sense. Mr. Sandy says, I'm going through. I'm going through. No I don't what care what the thing. rest of the world decides to do. I right. still love that song. <laughs> I don't think I've never heard it until you just said it. She said, yeah. the way the Lord's despised few, I've started in Jesus, and I'm going through. I don't oh, think man. I've heard that old hymn. That might be before my time. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it sounded good. We're going to have to get a piece of that. Mm -hmm. so, let's look at this before we close it out. He's telling us to pay the price, and their church did this in their founding years. He said there were times when their whole month offering would be $2,000 for the whole month. You know, yeah. and um, they now give millions of dollars every year to missions. I'm gonna say that again. There was a time when they were at two thousand. This is not an old church. This church is not too. Not I mean, just maybe a couple <coughs> of years, some of that sort. But from a, from a budget where they were struggling to, to, to make things happen with two thousand dollars a month to a church that on an annual basis is giving millions of dollars outside of themselves. I mean, they got a coffee house that is designed to take every penny of profit to give and fund ministry and all these things. They're giving millions of dollars every single year. And you see the correlation of how in their years where God was giving them the challenge to give outside of their budget, outside of what they could afford, outside of what they could add up on paper and that he took that and because they're faithful to hearing his voice that now i'm going to read you i'm going to read you this verse i want you to tie in here it is this comes from luke chapter 6 verse 38 i know y'all love it give and it will be given to you press down Good measure. press down shake it together it and run it over. over will be put into your bosom but with the same measure that you use it it will be <coughs> back to you. And the context is far reaching. There's more areas, but it also includes money. Don't don't leave that out. And here it is. This church was an example that they didn't do everything by the numbers of their budget or by what they saw on paper. They, they, they heard from their accountant, but then they heard from heaven. And heaven said, do this. And they didn't walk by sight. They walked by faith. And they did it. So yeah. closing out, I need to hear from y'all. Is that not just applicable for ministries, but is it also applicable in our one-on-one -on -one homes and households for us to line up with God that way, that when he tells us to give anything, that we should just take him at his word and do it? Can y'all speak on that as we close out? I will. I'll say it real, real quick on my end. So it, the, it was the cost of my trust, and I had to plant my faith. I'm going to tell you what I mean. So in 2015, when he told me to write the book, well, he had been telling me when I finally wrote it, let me say it like that. I had less than a loaf of bread and less than one fish. I'll say that. Single mother living off of less than $700 in disability a month. And I had to self-publish a book. I had no money, none at all. But I know what God said and I had been avoiding it for so long. The question I told y'all, it says, do you want me to give it to someone else? That was my charge. So I just started writing. And then I connected with Pastor Mel, who connected me to an editor. I connected with someone else, with him again for the graphic designer. Like every time I needed something, somebody was in place. A connection was there, right? So when it came time to, to publish the book, what was needed came from where it needed to come from. What was sown was multiplied because I had to keep ordering more and more books because people were buying and buying. So I'm saying all that to say, Sometimes the biggest cost may not be your life. It's going to be your trust. Mm. Trust what God says. It looks like total contradiction. He tells you to do something and you like, for real, Lord, I'm going to do that. I don't even, I would. But if you just pay the trust and let your faith be planted in that, you will see a return. But you've got to be willing to pay the cost of your trust. That is good. Hashtag pay the trust. That's, that's the currency in heaven, faith and trust in God. It's not the money, that's on our side of the, of the equation. You remember math, I want all that good math. <laughs> a lot of times that's a line. One side of the equation, another side of the equation. But on God's side of the equation, the currency is faith and trust. And our side of the equation 
It's dollar bills, y'all. Y'all know yeah. what I'm saying? Benjamins in, in particular, right? So when you right. see that, you're moving with faith and something happens on this side. We will yeah. not always understand it. We will not always be able to you know, trace it like we want to trace it. But right. I know when we operate with faith and trust in God, because of what he told us to do it, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That means God <laughs> told you to do it, not somebody else. God told right. you to do it. Right. It's going to work out the math on this side. Minister, yes. Minister Carol, I want to hear from you. How does this resonate with you that when we step out, it ain't always going to line out, line up and line out, but got to work it out? I can think of so many aspects in my own life where that's all it took. And I think when you when you when you really can't see the other side, it's it, it gets hard. Even my journey here to um, to San Antonio, I I've been teaching eleven years at the same school, and when I resigned, I resigned, came here with no house, came here with 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 with, with my faith. Told my children we were going to move and. They cried and they begged and they pleaded, but God, I saw it door after door after door after door open. God moved every everything, and all I heard from the, the people in this city, she ain't going nowhere. Came and joined joined the church, and my brother was calling back, "Well, can I join the church?" And the first thing <laughs> that, that don't mean nothing. She ain't going nowhere. But when you trust God, and it started with a dream, I dreamed that God wanted me to leave Mississippi. Yeah. I dreamed it and I dreamed it for years and I ran for years and I ran and ran and ran until I ran out. Yeah. And I've been here 20 years and everybody said that I'd move back and I'll be, <laughs> I'll just be after 20 years if I'm going back unless I hear that. <laughs> and I gotta hear some horrible <laughs> stuff. It ain't gonna be with somebody else and it's gonna be hell. <laughs> right. <laughs> you trust God to make a way. I mean, I mean I can resonate with so many things. My, my children, if you give them up, I'll give, I, I'll take care of them. I'll give them back. My mom, I'll give them back. I mean, you just got to trust him, y'all. When he, if he said it, he meant it, that settled it, every aspect. Even with my book, Pastor pushed me for 10 years to write that book. And for 10 years, I pushed him right back. <laughs> And until I ran out to the end of me and I wasn't nowhere else to run, I wrote that book. And I and I thank him every day for pushing me. And not only is that, I'm telling you, I can testify, Pastor pushed you in every area. Mm. And you gonna even jump? <laughs> you gonna even jump and, and, and trust God to get you? Because if you are in relationship with Pastor, you yes. shall be pushed. I shall be pushed. <laughs> I love that too. I mean, it's not like I'm a bad guy. So. No, bad. we love that about you. We love that about you. You are not afraid to joking. let people operate in their gifts. I love that. I'm just joking. I want our big sister to close us out tonight. And I want you to speak, Minister Renee, to someone. They're holding their seed, they're holding that coffee bean so tightly in their hand. And they just think that if I protect it and I keep it, I can use it for me. It really ain't enough for me in my house, but it's all I got, and, I, and I'm gonna hold on to it. I want you to be used to God tonight. Whether that whether that coffee bean, God has need of it in whatever ministry they're a part of, or whether God has need of it in a vision that He's assigned for their hands to do, however He's assigned for them to do it but they know that is God. Will you allow God to use you tonight to speak to that person about that coffee bean that they've been holding on to and how they need to get to a place of no return where they can't go back. And let's close out tonight on how they need to pay the price. Mm. So God has given you something and it's a scene, the coffee bean that, that pastor's talking about. Um, if you eat it, you ate the seed, and that's it. Uh, you know, God put us on the earth to have that abundant life, and abundance means there's a harvest somewhere. And if you, for you to take your seed and just hold it, 
uh, you know, put it in a drawer, put it in a box. Just think of it. You have one seed, you have a handful of seeds or whatever. Until you put those things where it can grow, until you plant it in a soil, and I mean plant it and cover it up and leave it there and let God do what he needs to do with it or whatever, you'll never get your harvest. And God is calling us for, for the harvest. He's created us give a harvest. He's giving you a dream because there's a harvest in your life. There's there's fruit in your life that has yet to be produced. And as long as you're holding on to it, you don't trust God, you don't believe. And, and, and so many of us, what it is, is you don't believe that God will bless it. You don't believe he'll multiply it. You don't believe that he'll take care of you. And you know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Please God. Hey, because you know, uh, if we're going to please him, we have to believe that not just that he is, we have to believe that he is a rewarder of oh, those, those that diligently seek him. And come on now, you, you've gotten this far and you're sitting there with your seed, your little thing, what you're holding, that little bit of money, it's in the bank, it's measured. Uh, what's it doing for you? The money's not, not producing. Uh, you can't make money. You you know, it's an economic fact. Do you know that you put that money in that bank account and you draw that little 1% interest? You can't make no money just with the money sitting in there. You put it underneath your, your mattress. You hold it up there. You put it in, in, in those little things. Until you take it out and begin to spend and begin to invest. And that's what we've been talking about all night long. We've been talking about investing. We've been talking about having a dream because what you have is the key and the answer for somebody else to make yes there's yes. another soul that's on your route who's going to touch another soul that's going to touch another soul and you never know as you sow what you're sowing now when it will come back around and bless you or maybe it'll bless your seed maybe your child will be blessed maybe someone in your family will be blessed you never know we have to trust god enough to release what he's given us he's given it to us as minister carol said as Sister Nikki has said, Mr. Wayne said, we have to give it back to him. We trust him enough to put it in his hands. Little becomes much, the song said, right? Yes. Put it in the master's hand. Mm. And it's time for us to release what we have in the master's hand. We've been sitting up in here for months in a pandemic. And you know, just like I know, you're sitting there with whatever you had sitting up in your house. And guess what? It was not enough. Somebody had to reach out somewhere. You had to go somewhere else to get something else. You had to take from what you had and invest. Some people have lost jobs. They have not been able to go forward to what they thought. They have dreams. They feel it just scattered. But, but you know, we have a God that looks over the earth looking and searching for who will trust me, who will hear me, who will obey me. And trust and obey is what we have to do. Trust Amen. and do it. Just don't sit there and say, oh, I'm holding on to my money. I'm trusting God. No. You're not, you're not trusting God as long as you're holding on to what that seed that he's given you. But when you invest it, you give it back to him. Like Mr. Carol said, you have to give it back. She said she's released her children. Your children will get saved. <laughs> right. If you give your children back to God, your children will be all right. Mm -hmm. If you give your life back to God, your life will be what he intended it to be. Mm -hmm. Your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard. Mm -hmm. Never entered into your heart what he has in trust for you. But don't 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 look at God the way we look at people. People mistreat, people use, people disappoint. Mm -hmm. But God never fails, and He Amen. loves us. He loves us. And he loves, he loves us. That's what we can do about it. Hallelujah and Amen. We'll close out with this. The invitation is simple. We don't need to make it long and drawn out. God has already spoken to your heart. Maybe you've watched this by replay, or maybe you've been with us live tonight. Type in the comments what your response is to the Lord. Not to us, but to the Lord. Whatever you do, word or indeed, let it be unto the Lord and for his glory. He'll save you tonight or this morning, whenever you're watching. Your membership. Maybe maybe this is not the place where God wants you to be a member at the Joshua House of Worship. We're not uh, uh, for everybody and, and, and every person. That would be ludicrous to think so, but perhaps it is for you. Maybe this is the family where God wants to plant you. If it's so, let us know. Type M for membership in the comments. Or maybe you want to be a partner in stewardship and you want to sow into the soil and help us to reach more people and do more. 
or maybe you're going to rededicate your life to the Lord tonight, or you need prayer tonight. Whatever your need is, put the appropriate letter or spell out the appropriate word, put it in the comments, and one of our ministry staff will be getting back in touch with you so that we can be on one accord to the Lord, and where two or three will touch on anything, so God will be in our midst, and so it shall be done. In closing, I also want to thank all of our panel tonight. You blessed me always. We've had some incredible comments. I'll close out with some of those. Minister Ethel says, God can make a way out of no way. She says, take him at his word and just do it. Uh, she says, I push with love. That's right, sis, with love. It's a love push. My dad says, knowing God by his desire, I believe you won't fail. Amen. Minister Sammy says, amen, Minister Vivian. And then Brother Man of God Mark says, great lesson, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to pick you up from the airport, Mark. Don't worry. I got you. I got you, man. I got you. So listen, I close with this. There are 200 and, excuse me, 260 days that we've lived out in this year of 2020. And I don't know, sometimes we didn't know whether we was coming or going, but we know God has held us in the palm of his hand and his loving arms have been all around us. There are 106 days remaining in the calendar year. If he chooses for us to remain here, there's purpose, there's assignment, and there's a price to be paid. I want to challenge you over the next 106 days. Will you pay the price that is required of you? You should put this in your comments, put it in your notes. Grand Grandpa would say it this way, put it in your pipe and smoke it. Mm -hmm. I will sow into my dream. Let that be your mantra for the rest of the year. I will sow into my dream. Whatever it is that God has given you and your hands yeah. to do, your heart to do. Check this out. Here's another one. I am, I am a generous giver where God has planted you in ministry. Be generous with your giving. And I believe that God would open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't even have room enough to receive. Yeah. Here's another one as you're paying the price. I invest in where I'm going. That's I invest good. in what I'm becoming. I invest in what I believe in. I'm going to say those three. Yes. I invest in where I'm going. I invest in what I'm becoming. And I invest in what I believe in. So if you really believe in something, invest. If you're really becoming something, invest. And if you yes. really want to go somewhere, invest. Yes. Pay the price. Make the investment. Tonight we have a few prayer requests that we want to offer up. I'm going to have um, I want to have uh, uh, Sister Nikki to close out in prayer with the prayer request. Deacon Wallace has surgery tomorrow. That's our brother, our champion. We call him Superman. Uh, but he has to have a surgery on tomorrow. Even Superman gets hurt sometimes, right? And it's going to be about six to eight weeks. He's going to be pretty much out, out of service. So we want to lift him up in our prayers. His, his lovely wife, uh, I, I hear from him that he's doing better that it has something to do with her sugar levels that caused her to have her eye problems uh, where she was not able to see that well and her vision began to get very blurry and such. Uh, so it has something to do with her sugar levels. Keep this for Natalie lifted up in your prayers. I want you to also touch and agree. There's a beautiful baby girl. I haven't met her, met her mom online. Her mom uh, said that I could mention this to you. Be in prayer for Arion Richardson. Arion Richardson. She's never had seizures before. And now all of a sudden, uh, this past week was the first time in her whole life she's ever had seizures. <coughs> she's been hit with some seizures and you know, all of those types of things that go along with that. So she has to see neurologists and all that. Be in prayer for touch and agree. Arion Richardson. Last but not least, our brother Joe. Joe McKay, our brother, he had a seizure. I didn't even know he had seizures. But uh, Tootie said that 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 it was it was not uncommon for him. But nonetheless, we want he's home recuperating. We want to keep him lifted up in our prayers. Want to keep her lifted up in our prayers. And if it's not too selfish, we sure enough got to pray for him. Because that brother did some cooking the other day, and they put a picture out there on Facebook. And listen, I'm about to put, I'm about to put an order in. So we need him healed up real good. Y'all understand what I'm saying? No, we really do want to pray for Joseph McGee, Arion Richardson, Sister Natalie, and of course Deacon Wallace. I'm going to have. Uh, our sister Nikki to close us out in prayer for them. Last announcement. I want to thank God for all of our stewards, those who are sewing into the Joshua House of Worship. Let me put it on the screen for you real quickly. So those who would like to sew tonight, 
you can go to our PayPal link, which is paypal.me forward slash Joshua House of Worship. We thank you so very much for your generosity, your cheerful spirit in which you have helped us, whether you are a partner from afar or a membership, wherever, <coughs> wherever you are, we thank God for you. You are helping this small church to make a big impact. In the coming Sunday, we're going to have a powerful message of landline, uh, excuse me, landmine uh, that's going to be dealt with. It's called slowfulness. And <laughs> what a lesson it's going to be. Don't miss this coming Sunday. And look, look, if you miss next Sunday, then that means you're being slowful. So don't make sure you don't miss it and uh, you'll be all right. And then we're going to have another message. Oh, my God. The, the brothers and sisters who have blessed us to help us get our house in order. Shout out to Nelly, Peter, to Harina. Shout out to Katina, Passmore Clark. Shout out to Coach Todd Strand, Miss Maria Smith, my favorite CBA. Shout out to Minister, Minister Wayne and Dawn, his beautiful wife, and our sister Nancy, who have been our guests. We have some special guests coming this Sunday who are ready, set, able, and willing to help us put our house in order. You don't want to miss part three. It's coming up this Sunday. Nikki, would you close us out in prayer also for Dick and Wallace, Sister Natalie? Baby girl, Arion and Joseph McGee, will you close us out in prayer, my dear? Yes, sir. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now we give you glory and honor. And we thank you, Lord God, for ministering to us, meeting us where we, where we all are. And Lord God, just allowing each of us to learn from each other. And we lift each other up tonight in the name of Jesus. Everybody who's watching now or will watch by the replay, we ask that you would touch their hearts touch their bodies and touch their finances. Meet every need, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God, right now we lift up Deacon Wallace. Lord God, we thank you for bringing him through surgery. We thank you, Lord God, for being his operator. We thank you, Lord God, for operating through every medical staff that will have to come in contact with him. And we thank you, Lord God, for his complete and speedy recovery. But we also thank you, Lord God, for that time he's gonna have to spend with you, minister to him and speak to his heart during this time, God. We ask that you will bless and touch Sister Natalie. We command in the mighty name of Jesus, through faith, in the name of Jesus, that her blood sugar levels will regulate in Jesus' name, Lord. We ask that you will touch her eyesight, that you will touch her blood vessels, and everything high sugar, sugar levels, Lord God, can affect. We ask that you will regulate, that you will heal completely in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we uh, pray for Arian Richardson and also for Brother Joseph. Lord God, we command at the root cause of those seizures that they be healed, God. Give the doctors wisdom, Father, on how to tend to them. If it is not your will to heal them supernaturally, we ask that you move through the medical staff, God, for complete and total healing and restoration. We pray and declare over their bodies. And anybody else, Lord God, that is watching now or has a family member that needs healing or that is sick in their body, Lord God, we declare healing in the mighty name of Jesus. And we stand on that and we will speak nothing else. In Amen. Jesus' name, we, we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Love you all tonight. Thank y'all for paying such a price, being up late. We'll talk to you real soon in the future. Praise God, family, Pastor Mel here. Listen, whether you got connected with our marriage enrichment, young adult ministry, or serving in the children's shelter, even the nursing home, whether you met us in person or online, we are a small church making a big impact. But we got a message for you. Come grow with us.